Ah, hello, my Kako. My Kako, oh, 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 Ke kaho aku aloha ya kaho atau aloha no. So I'm I'm Sam Ohukan Ohu or Sam depending on how you met me. And I am senior scientist and cultural advisor for the Nature Conservancy of Hawaii. Each of the speakers here has has talked about the changes to come, and I think that no one in this room needs to needs any convincing about those kinds of changes. The models and the observations that we're making, we're seeing more and frequent and intense storms, more abrupt and shifted transitions between seasons. Um, we can anticipate hot, dry areas in the lowlands becoming even hotter and even drier, and changes in the factors of cloud formations that might narrow the wet zones on our mountain flanks and on our, on our summits, along with drifting and narrowing of the agricultural sweet spots. Uh, and sweet zones upward on the mountain flanks, um, uh, such as on in Kula on Maui or in Kona on Hawaii. Um, and as a scientist for and a cultural advisor for one of those uh, organizations that have been charged with the kuleana of managing our biocultural resources um, in this pai'aina of ours, um, I want to share some of the approaches that we're uh, uh, adopting and encouraging um, with regard to climate change in Hawaii. One of our major strategies is, is building resilience. Um, our natural systems are complex feedback systems, just like a person is a complex feedback system. And when a person is sound and healthy, and you're taking a long hike, let's say, all day, you can take that crossing um, of a stretch of hot, waterless lava, or you can take a plunge into frigid waters to get from the boat to the shore uh, where you need to be. But when the body is, is stressed or injured or diseased, um, even everyday activities might be difficult and any additional stress might prove fatal. So one of our major strategies is building the resilience and the health of our, of our native ecosystems, strengthening the existing native ecosystems to prepare them for the times of change ahead rather than just anticipating what's going to happen, taking the status quo as we know it, and hoping to adapt those systems against them. We need to start now to bolster those systems and strengthen them against the changes ahead. Um, one of the things that, uh, that uh, might be obvious is to remove the non-native weeds and pest animals that are the analogs of, of bacteria or tumors growing unwanted in a patient's body. Now, anytime that you look at a rich native mix of hundreds of, of plants in a functioning native watershed and compare that to the smooth stems of a single species, say strawberry guava, um, from Brazil growing in an area and transpiring, you know, evaporating more uh, water than any native forest would and uh, allowing the water to just drip down those smooth uh, bark into the groundwork and sheet off and, and send sediment to our reefs. Those are the kinds of things we're talking about removal of those kinds of very obvious stresses, whether it's rats that, are, that might be unseen in our forests and, and eating the seeds of, of plants and, um, and destroying the eggs of, of native birds that pollinate those trees. Um, those are the kinds of things that happen now, but probably don't happen at the rate and at the, at the scale that they need to be in order to truly bolster our systems against, against changes to come. Another is to pay close attention to the developing picture of expected change and anticipating the areas that might be hit by more frequent drought or more intense storms and plan to deal with those kinds of consequences, whether it means planting sensitive and rare um, species ahead of the moving front of ecosystem change, anticipating where the wet zone will move and, and taking assisting plants in moving upward. We're talking about rates of changes that are you know, many-fold greater than the natural rates of change. 
Since we are responsible for that increased rate of change, we should be also responsible for assisting those species that would otherwise be swept over by those, those uh, fast-moving changes and giving them a chance by moving them ahead of, ahead of those kinds of things. We're not talking about wholesale uprooting of things and moving them ahead, but anticipating that all things are living, have their period of time in, in their systems, and contribute to the, the reproduction of the forest uh, that they're in. And therefore, our ability to anticipate and place and place and augment and restore where, where places are damaged. Those are the kinds of things we're talking about. Um, bolstering our wildfire prevention and suppression in areas that are becoming more prone to fire that we can easily anticipate by looking at where places are becoming drier. Or mitigating the sediment effects of more frequent floods on our reefs, our estuaries, and our marine uh, system. <coughs> To bring these kinds of strategies into play on the whole island level means bolstering our landscape management partnerships, such as the watershed partnerships that are now present um, uh, on all of the higher islands. Um, the Nature Conservancy is one of those land managing and advisory members in nearly all of these, all of these partnerships. And so we've had a, a long time to, to look at how these kinds of things can work and how they might be improved. Um, we encourage each of them to work with the existing partners to bring the broadest benefits to each landscape on each island, ignoring the land ownership and jurisdictional boundaries um, that might exist between a national park, a state forest reserve, a private ranch land, a board of water supply um, uh, a unit of land that all lie contiguous with each other. Um, when you ignore those boundaries, work together, gather the funds together, and, and plan out the health improvement of the entire watershed rather than your own particular uh, piece, the, uh, the, the results are, are amazing. And so since 1991, the, the East Maui Watershed Partnership, which was the first one formed, um, has kind of demonstrated clearly the power of that kind of, of uh, working together of federal, state, and private uh, entities with communities to, to bring improvements up upon the land. Beyond the on-the-ground management to prepare for climate change is the bolstering of coordination between all of the government and non-government uh, entities, um, all of which have some kuleana or stake in our lands and waters. Um, so we're an active member in the Hawaii Conservation Alliance, and Stanton put up this neat slide that had all of the logos of the different of like different government things. Sometimes I go to these meetings and it's like the same faces um, sitting in different contexts, whether it's uh, Pacific Islands Climate uh, Change Consortium, the Hawaii Conservation Alliance, or the Kamaliho uh, uh, um, Forest Restoration uh, Projects. It's, it's an amazing kind of thing. And yet, and yet, um, that's the, that's the, um, that's in part, part of the power of the thing. Do I have a lot of time left? <laughs> okay, good, good, good. Um, so, you know, it, it, maybe it, it, it's kind of like a faceless alphabet soup of agencies otherwise, right? You say, Pixie, what the heck is Pixie? What the heck is ICAP? Um, what the heck is the HCA, right? And, um, and so uh, it shifts us from these nameless entities that we kind of like look askance at and maybe even distrust. Um, to actual uh, uh, human faces um, that we need to, to be working with in order to face the much broader challenges. And that's the best thing about symposia such as this, is the opportunity to put those human faces on, on what would otherwise be a mishmash of, of, of faceless alphabet soup agencies. Um, but instead of that, we turn into Kama'aina working together to do the work um, that we need to do. Indeed. It is through community, this community of caring and devoted individuals that's going to take us all forward um, to deal with climate change. Mahalo.